Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruid and I'm the host for today's talk. Today's speaker is Andrew Harvey. Andrew is a junior professor of African Languages and the Construction of Knowledge in the Faculty of Languages and Literatures at the University of Bayreuth in Germany. Beginning with work on Gorwa and expanding to Ihanzu and Hatsa, Andrew's work engages with the complex language situation present in central Tanzania's Rift Valley, where languages of all four of Greenberg's African language phyla are spoken and have been spoken for some time. His research foci include language contact and morphosyntax, with the understanding that any linguistic insight must be tied to a community-driven documentary record, combining and celebrating the languages, cultures, and histories of the speaker communities involved. Please join me in welcoming Andrew as he gives this talk today, which is the retrospective of the Rift Valley webinar series of year four. Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you, Anna, for the introduction. Today's talk is a retrospective, and I'd like to start by recognizing that Anna Coyd, as well as Martha Booker Johnson, as hosts of these webinars, play a crucial, uh, play a crucial role in the success of this series, and all their work is something I appreciate very much. Um, because the webinar series was launched by our colleague Richard Griscom and I in April of 2019, the passage of our years has always been marked in March rather than January, and this year is no different. In 2019, Richard and I thought that it might be nice to get our friends and colleagues together and hear what they had to say about the relatively small area of north central Tanzania in which we work, and to our delight, what began as uh, what we expected to be an ad hoc series, which would run for a couple of months, has grown into a fortnightly seminar series in perpetuity, providing space for specialists from all around the globe to share their ideas on this complex and vibrant part of the world, which we call the Tanzanian Rift Valley. In past years, uh, we've used the final yearly slot in the series as an opportunity to look back on what has been said during the year, to summarize and reflect and to identify the generative themes, the salient silences and omissions that occurred throughout, as well as how the talks have brought out different elements of our network's mission. This talk aims to do this for our 2020 uh, to 2023 series, what is our fourth year of webinars. In terms of format, we try to make these retrospectives a bit shorter than a regular webinar, so as to leave room for lots of discussion at the end. In this vein, while the talk portion of today's webinar will be recorded and posted to YouTube, the question and answer period, or what is more likely to be a discussion period, will not be recorded. I'll begin by giving some statistics on our talks, the first being the overall number of talks given in comparison to previous years. You'll see that this year's series featured 16 talks, two less than the year before. The decrease from year three was because of a couple of last minute cancellations, as well as our implementation of a month long summer break during the month of August, when most of our members are otherwise busy. For comparison, I've included Leiden University's Colloquium on African Languages and Linguistics, uh, abbreviated as CAL, a long-standing annual summer meeting, which occurs over a couple of days with 56 talks in total in 2022. When we look now at the total number of hours for this year's series, we can see that at nearly 20, talks uh, on a per talk basis tend to be longer. In fact, more than twice as long per talk as each talk given at call. Uh, spaces which allow for these longer form talks seem rather uncommon. And I think that providing a space for talks that run around an hour each, including questions and answers, is an important niche which we currently fill. I'd like to highlight, as in previous years, that the talks from the Rift Valley Network webinars are not given and then forgotten about. Because they're made available online, both on YouTube through our channel and on Zenodo, the average webinar talk receives far more exposure than an average conference talk. Here we can see the talks given in the year four series received over 60 hours of watch time on YouTube after being posted there. Um, and this figure only increases over time. Talks from our first webinar series' first year have now logged over 170 hours of watch time. 
uh, total watch time across all our Rift Valley network material, including workshops outside of the webinar series, is approaching 600 hours. To put that into perspective, the Introduction to African Languages course I taught at Bayreuth last semester was uh, two hours per week and was attended uh, over a 14-week period by a classroom of around 20 students. This course then would have a watch time of just around 560 hours. Put in this way, Rift Valley Network content over the course of four years has had a wider audience on YouTube than uh, an in-person university course. Statistics are similar for Zenodo, uh, where talks from this year have been downloaded almost 40 times, and total downloads for all Rift Valley Network talks, including workshop presentations, now approach nearly 700. We've also been able to chart our presenters according to a couple of important axes, uh, gender and whether or not they are Tanzanian. These figures are given here. Beyond the numbers, I like to go back and re-listen to all of the webinars and try to identify some themes that bring things together. Um, as last year, I've condensed what we've talked about under three headings, common threads, ways in which the talks have reflected our mission statement, as well as salient silences or elephants in the room. This is obviously subjective, but I hope what I found will give some insight as well as spur discussion later. I'll start with general themes or common threads, um, of which I've decided to talk about three, novel data, novel methods, justice, heritage, and repatriation, and networks. In underscoring novel data, novel methods, I wanted to highlight work that is particularly new. Uh, this can include new data, such as Alex Anderson and uh, I looking at Hodge's interjections, uh, new methods, such as Terrell Schrock's highly original examination of metathesis as both a synchronic and diachronic force for change in the languages of East Africa, um, as well as Harold Hammerstrom's big data meets bibliometrics approach to shedding light on how well described the languages of the Tanzanian Rift and the African continent in general are or are not. Uh, Stephen Goldstein's talk was novel in both ways, bringing uh, new data on Kakapel rock shelter and new phytolithic analyses to bear on old debates about the spread of food crops as well as food production across time. A second theme which emerged was related closely to the people with whom we work. I named this justice, heritage, and repatriation. Discussions about uneven and shifting power relations, both historical in the case of Martin Mouse's talk on East African hunter-gatherers, and more contemporary in the case of Jeremy Coburn's talk on Hadza language vitality, asked us to think about how our work interfaces with representations, as well as the repercussions of those representations. The concept of heritage also featured heavily in several talks this year, be that physical heritage, such as the petroglyphs spread throughout the Sandawe homeland, some of which are threatened with flooding, as described by Matthew Nisley, um, as well as less tangible forms of heritage, such as the oral histories represented in the materials with which Jan Bender Shetler has been working for the past decades, as well as in the case of Jeremy Coburn's presentation on Hadza, a language itself. The task of repatriation or how to return these objects of heritage was also brought up again in Jan Bender Shetler's talk, in this case, a digital return through electronic media technology. And in the case of Mary Prendergast's discussion of ancient DNA, the actual human remains of individuals currently housed in places like London, Cambridge, and Tübingen. A third common thread was that of networks. Um, we at the Rift Valley Network were fortunate to host some discussions of networks of considerably greater antiquity than four years, 
Jennifer Miller and Yiming Wang's work on ostrich eggshell beads and a chain of cultural connection stretching from East to Southern Africa, as well as Mauro Tosco and Bonnie Sands' presentation on early connections between language communities in East Africa, remind us that a long period of African prehistory was defined by interconnectedness, sometimes ultimately over very wide geographic areas indeed. Jan Bender Shetler's treatment of networks was rather more intimate, but nonetheless important. Contemporary connections between people which sustain an archive of cultural and historical materials, as well as enrich it through things like family connections and networks of activism and local historians. I've said before that I like to look at the year of webinars through the lens of the Rifali Network mission statement because it allows us to see the ways in which this enters into dialogue with the work of our members. Here I've highlighted a few key elements and we'll now sort of talk a bit about how a handful of these emerged over the past year. This is more of a topical statement, but it's pretty clear that the majority of our talks cleave closely to the history, languages, and cultures purview of the mission. Helen Eaton's talk on grammatically conditioned tone lowering in Sandawe, Stanislav Boletsky's sketch of verb morphology in Ihanzu, and Rael Dire's talk on singulatives in Cushitic and the methodological challenges in researching them are three diverse examples of how we've engaged with languages this year. As we've moved to include a greater range of voices from disciplines, including archaeology, we've had some great discussions on the past of the rift and its wider environs, one such talk being Stephen Goldstein's mentioned earlier. A great example of cultural exchange, this time represented through the linguistics of crop terms in Akie, is given in Amani Lusakello's talk, The Akie Society of Tanzania, a contribution in Amani's classic style. It's also great to hear about people working together to move our understanding forward. Not only is Mauro Tosco and Bonnie Sands' presentation on early East African and peripheral East Cushitic the product of a collaboration between two linguists, but I really encourage members to go back and listen to the question and answer period directly following it. Attended by a wide variety of experts and interested parties, it really represents the kind of respectful, enthusiastic, and interdisciplinary dialogue we want to foster at the Rift Valley Network. The kind of collaboration in Makarius Itambu's talk on archaeological research in Singida also featured collaboration at its core, but this time the collaboration between a senior researcher and a large team of archaeology students from the University of Dar es Salaam. The concept of a field school is rather more common in archaeology than linguistics, and I really wonder what a Rift Valley Network field school might look like. Once again, talks in this, year web, in this year's webinar series challenge narratives that are often taken for granted. True to form, Matthew Nisley shows that Tanzanian's inventory of petroglyphs was vastly underestimated, uh, while Jeremy Coburn's talk raises the alert on Hadza language vitality, a language widely accepted as small but in vigorous use is, in fact, facing some immediate challenges to remain spoken into this century. Jeremy also hints at signs of community revitalization and wider activism, a welcome reframing of the narrative of speakers of endangered languages as being helpless or somehow needing to be saved. This serves as a good segue into the next facet of the Rift Valley Network mission, that is building solidarity and shared agency. Jeremy's talk, especially in the question and answer period, gives some time to how the community responses to language endangerment can be supported and strengthened. And in a similar way, Jan Bender Shetler's talk is an inspiring look at how cultural communities come to value their oral histories and ways in which outsiders like her and uh, like many of us can connect with and support the aspirations of Tanzanians who want to be stewards of their own cultural resources. As mentioned above, Makari Sitambu's work running field schools with Tanzanian university students is another view of building agency from within. And I'm highly interested in learning more about his teaching work in this area. 
Macarius and Jan's talk, talks are also about how people talk to each other, both between researchers and between researchers and local communities, uh, as well as between researchers and various authorities. I'll now mention two of what I call elephants in the room, so salient silences which ran throughout many of our talks. The first relates to a specific tool I would like to learn more about and which I think would be relevant to many of our members, and the second to sort of this idea of disruption, resilience, and starting again. The first elephant was not exactly a silence, but remained just under the level of being directly addressed. And that was what I've termed here the art of the community meeting. In many ways, the community meeting is a common experience of most of us conducting research in the Tanzanian Rift, but something that we up to now have never explicitly discussed. I, and I think many of our colleagues here would be interested in having a discussion one day and learning about how each of us have done this in the past and about times when things have gone smoothly, as well as times when uh, things have maybe not gone so smoothly. A second elephant I'd like to name is COVID-19. At the very least, COVID resulted in most of us having to radically restructure ongoing projects and more seriously, entirely postpone or abandon lines of research deemed too risky in sort of the COVID context. COVID is mentioned once or twice in this year's webinar series, but again, from a learning perspective and perhaps even one of achieving some kind of catharsis, it would also be beneficial to hear about how the pandemic has affected our work as a group, as well as how each of us are getting back on track. To finish, it's now really important that I recognize and thank each of this year's participants. Putting together a talk for an audience which is at once interdisciplinary, but also populated with experts is not an easy task. But um, every talk this year has been a unique and valuable contribution to what we know uh, and to where our inquiries develop. I also think that it's important to thank our attendees. I've been told again and again what a friendly group the Rift Valley Network is, and I hope that we can continue to nurture that environment into the future. So thank you all, and I look forward to our discussion as we turn from looking back at the year past to looking forward to the one to come. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Andrew, for this really interesting overview of the last year of the Red Valley webinar series. Looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 5th of April. It will be presented by Lutz Martin, and it is titled Kita Language Research Between Community Documentation and Linguistic Ecology.